announcement. That's good. Cool. So last week, uh, I, if you were here last week, uh, the Lord changed the message very, very shortly before I got up to preach it. And uh, so uh, this week, as I was just thinking and asking the Lord, I really felt like I was to share the message from last week. So, um, so uh, last week, I, in preparation for this message last week, I read uh, Isaiah 61 at the beginning of the service, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. Uh, we were at a conference one time, and a guy got up, read that verse, and then he said, here's my interpretation of that verse. Get your shine on. And so, I want to talk to you today about what we were designed for. Because I know that the world would tell you, oh, you were designed to be this or that. You were designed to be an artist. You were designed to be a CEO. You were designed to lead people. You were designed to be a monk. You know, all that stuff. And you know what? Um, we each have gifts and callings, but you were only designed for one thing. You were designed to shine. You were designed to shine. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. You were designed to shine. That doesn't mean that you put makeup on with like a glossy glow. It doesn't mean you varnish your face. It doesn't mean that we're going to get light machines and, and colored lights are going to shine all over. No. What were we designed to shine? The glory of the Lord. We were designed to reflect the glory of God. On Sunday mornings, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, we were designed to shine and reflect the glory of God. I want to I want to read a scripture real quick. Uh, uh, Romans chapter eight, uh, verse eighteen through twenty-eight. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. How does God reveal His sons and daughters? He lets His glory shine upon them. Right? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, of decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So when we struggle, when we face trials, when we suffer, it has only one purpose for the believer. To reveal and manifest God's glory, His faithfulness, and His provision for our lives. The purpose of the believer's struggle and suffering is to not look at what we're suffering from and not look at what we're struggling with, but to look at the Lord and let His glory shine on us despite what we're going through. Whatever, whatever disease, dysfunction operates in your life cannot stand up to the glory of God. Because disease and dysfunction are a result of sin and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, when we get a right perspective on whatever we're going through, and we get our eyes back upon the Lord, and we, we like, like Cheryl's word, we say, I will not be shaken. Nothing. Nothing can shake us. In, uh, in, uh, in Daniel, there's a story of the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, the king had set up this huge, tall tower of an idol and said, when the music plays, everybody bow. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, not me, I'm not bowing to this idol. And so the king brought him in, said, boys, I'm going to give you one more chance. When the music plays, if you bow to this idol, you will live. If not, I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And they said, not going to do it. They said, nope. So the king heated up the furnace seven times hotter than normal. And the voice said this, we're not going to bow to your idol because our God will save us. And even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. To that idol. Even if he doesn't physically save us, we're still not going to bow to that idol. We're still not going to give credence to some false deity or some false god or something that is not real. Even if he doesn't save us, we're not going to bow. Now that's a word today. For you, if you're going through something and you don't know what the outcome is going to be, you still can let the glory of God shine through you in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain, in the midst of dysfunction, if we will stop focusing on that which is trying to kill us and focus on that which is trying to give us life. Even if we don't make it out of this world alive, and by the way, none of us do, I'm still not going to bow. I'm still not going to give credence to that thing trying to take my life. Because I know when I die, I don't really die. I had a buddy, he was a Baptist preacher, and we didn't see eye to eye theologically, imagine that. And, uh, but we loved each other, and we talked. And I remember one time I was preaching a sermon in this church, and, and, uh, and I said, guys, I don't know what we're all so worried about. We don't die. We don't die. And so he came up to me afterwards and he goes, uh, you know we die, right? And I said, yeah, but we don't die. And he said, yeah, but you know we die, right? And I said, yeah, but we don't die. I think this went on like three or four more times. Finally I said, all right, buddy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? 
I'm saying, I know physically we die, but our life is not a physical life. Our life is a spiritual life. So when the physical body dies, we don't die. We just transform into this glorious body that Christ is uh, preparing us uh, for us in heaven, and we don't die. And he goes, you know what I'm saying, right? I go, yes, physically we all have to die. I get that. And so this is the key, is that even if God doesn't answer our prayer, and whatever our dysfunction or disease is, it takes us, takes our life away from us, it stops the breath in our body, we don't die. And God still gets the glory for that even if this disease takes our life. God's glory is revealed and it manifests through our reconciliation to His original plan and design. God's glory is revealed when we understand we were designed to shine no matter what the circumstances are in our life. There's a familiar scripture, you've all heard it, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, depending upon your theology and your doctrine, most people will focus on the first phrase. For all have sinned. Myself, I like to read the entire verse and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means our sin hinders the glory of God from shining on us. But better than that, it means we were designed to carry His glory. And our sin is what hinders that. But our design and our purpose is to carry the glory of God with us everywhere we go. And we know because of Jesus and His sacrificial death and His resurrection that we now carry the very presence of God within us. So what do we carry? We carry the glory of God with us everywhere we go. This makes sense? Hmm. It's so quiet in here. Have I put you to sleep? Sorry. One of my pastors used to say, if you're tired, you think you're going to fall asleep, go stand up on the back wall. He said, I'll understand. Whatever you got to do to stay awake. It's okay. I'm a little tired this morning too. But you know what? I'm not focused on my physical... Uh, tiredness. I'm focused on my eternal life and the glory of God that shines within me and shines outside of me because I was designed for His glory. All right. Um, boy, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, I'm still preparing messages as if I was the only thing that mattered in this service. And so I'm, I'm, I'm learning to cut this down and uh, and get this um, and get to the, the meat. Um, so 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. What's the purpose of that? We are designed to think like God. We are designed to act like God. We are designed to behave like God. We were actually designed to do God's will upon this earth and steward the entire earth into looking like the Garden of Eden, which was the throne room of God on earth. That's our design and our purpose here on earth. It's not to throw garbage in a garbage truck. It's not to be the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. It's not 
anywhere in between. That Your purpose is not your job. I know, I know, I know you have a passion for something, but it's a gift and it's a calling, but it's not your purpose. So here's, here's why this matters. Uh, when I started working for the city of Clinton, I had to throw garbage in the back of a garbage truck. Anytime a garbage man was sick, I was a laborer at the street department. So the, the deal was when one of the garbage guys was sick or on vacation, I had to fill in. So I was a garbage man, I don't know, six, eight weeks out of the year. By the time I retired, I was a department head over the code enforcement department. But, here's the key. I became a department head, but the glory of God wasn't in me being department head. The glory of God was the fact that when I was throwing garbage in a garbage truck and I had uh, Christian music playing on, that, uh, on the, on the uh, radio and I had it turned up really loud so that when I jumped out of the truck to throw the garbage in, I could still hear it. And I would have people go, Hey, I like your music. They recognize Christian music. And so, so this was the key that no matter what your job is, we are designed to carry the glory of God. So whether I was throwing garbage in the truck or filling potholes in the street or, or, or managing a, a, an entire department of people, my design, my purpose in life is to shine the glory of God. And that's for you and me at all times. That's why we need the mind of Christ, because the mind of Christ is going to get us to this point where we take every thought captive and make it obedient to the will of God. Everything that comes our way, we capture that and we make it obedient to Christ. So in the midst of our pain and our suffering, and, and, and I get it, I, I, know, I know that there are things in this life that, that make us just want to give up. And they make us just, sometimes they make us just want to shout out and curse. Pain is so bad. I've, I've been there before. Uh, I've, I've been in pain two times where I thought I'd rather die than continue on. One was before I had given my heart to the Lord. And one was after. And the pain was so intense the, the first time that I, I knew for a fact that if I died, I would go to hell. But I still wanted to die because the pain was so bad. And uh, it was a miraculous intervention by God that Stopped all that, and that eventually led me to come back to the Lord. But, but then uh, uh, in 2012, I got a, an unknown sickness. We didn't know what it was. No doctor could diagnose it. They tried. They gave me several diagnoses, and all the medicine they gave me wouldn't work. And I still had this horrible pain in my back in this area. My MRIs on my back came back. There's nothing wrong. Uh, all the tests came back and said nothing wrong. One guy said, we think you have a weak core. Like, dude, this is bigger than a weak core. And uh, so, um, but the key was, is, man, I just want, the pain was so bad, I just wanted to die. And uh, the only thing that took the pain away was this medicine called Dilaudid. And they shot it into my veins. And then when they gave me that, then I started seeing things hallucinating. I said to Cheryl, laying in the Clinton Hospital. They had just shot me with this dilaudid, and I said, you know, I don't know if this was a dream or not, but a doctor just came, a, a bear just came in in a doctor's coat and gave me a hug. And she's like, oh my goodness, he has lost it. And, uh, but, 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 so, so I'm just telling you, I, I, I've been in situations where the, the pain has been so bad that I just wanted my life to end, but guess what? It wasn't time. That was, uh, that was about a three-month ordeal, 
And the, the intense pain was there for seven weeks. I was off work for seven weeks. I wasn't a guy that called in sick. I mean, you basically had to, like, do surgery on me to get me to take a day off. And so, um, uh, but it was, I was off seven weeks. And uh, because the pain was intense, and it was the first time in my life I ever started to experience anxiety because the pain was so bad, and nothing, no medicine would take it away. And uh, when I would go to the hospital, they would give me Dilaudid, but you just don't get to take that stuff home with you. So when you go home, you get these little pain pills that, uh, that first of all, um, that, that just didn't touch the pain. And so I, I, I had seven weeks of pain, and it was, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a crier. I'm not a guy that just cries at the, you know, at anything. And, and I mean, there were times when I just sat there and I just cried because it hurt so bad. And that's how she knew this was real. She was like, I, I think I've only ever seen him cry one other time in his life. But I'm just telling you, there are things in our life, and it's, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. But here's what I didn't do. We were involved in a little house church meeting on Tuesday night. I continued to go to those because I was the teacher there. And here's what would happen. I would be in pain when I got in the vehicle to go to the meeting. I would be in pain when I walked in these people's house. But the minute that I stepped up to teach, the pain was gone. And I would teach whatever lesson that I was teaching that day, and then I would go sit down, and pretty soon, the pain would come back. So I knew it was spiritual. Was it physical? Yes, it was physical. But the physical isn't the real world. The spiritual world is the real world. So whatever happens in the spiritual world is just reflected in the physical world. So you can go get a diagnosis, and and there's a list of, of dysfunctions and diseases, probably three miles long, uh, you know, of all the things that can be wrong with us. But all of it, all of those physical maladies are only a reflection of something spiritual that God can change. Does this make sense? Because we weren't designed to be miserable. We were designed to shine the glory of God. We were designed for His glory. This is truth. I'm just telling you. It's truth. Matthew 6.33. This is towards the end there, Augie. Matthew 6.33. When we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, His provision removes lack from our lives and fills us with His fullness. And that word fullness just means maturity uh, or completeness. When you seek the kingdom of God first, His glory shines upon us. And then all those other things will straighten out. Whether in this life or the next. Here's what I want to tell you. You all know Lazarus died, right? And Jesus waited four days and then He came and He raised Him from the dead. Guess what? He died again. He died again. You think your problems are bad. We only have to die once. Lazarus had to die twice. <laughs> I'm not making light of this stuff. I'm just saying, there's always somebody who has it worse. And if we focus on ourselves so much, and we focus on the pain, and we focus on the dysfunction, and we lose sight of God's design for our life, and we lose sight of how we probably don't have it as bad as somebody else. And if we lose sight that we were designed to shine for the glory of God, 
we'll probably stay right in this place where we're at, always thinking of ourselves and always thinking about, oh, oh, life is not good. In, in Psalm 73, Asaph is, has been a worship leader in the temple. Uh, he started in David's reign in the tabernacle, and then he's, he's now been 40 years leading worship. He now is in Solomon's beautiful temple that he, that he built. And um, he wakes up one day and he starts to journal. And he says, God is indeed good to Israel, but when I look at all the evil, when I look at the unrighteousness in the land, and then he begins to describe the evil and the unrighteousness. And he's getting depressed and more depressed and more depressed and more depressed. And he's outlining how evil people seem to be uh, living life with no troubles. And then he says, if I would have said these things out loud, I would have betrayed your people. And when I tried to figure it all out, this is the message version of this verse. When I tried to figure it out, all I got was a splitting headache. Then he said, but then I entered your sanctuary. So, now remember the old temple. He entered the sanctuary. Now he's coming from the outer court into the inner court. And the thing in front of him was the Holy of Holies. He was in the presence of God. And he said, oh yeah, but the evil people will pay for that. And then he begins to talk. About, he said, he, he, he took his eyes off of evil and he put his eyes upon the Lord. All of a sudden he had a complete different perspective on life. And then he wrote one of the greatest uh, worship songs ever. Who do I have in heaven but you? No one on earth will do. My heart and my flesh may fail. But God is the strength of my heart. Amen. God is the strength of your heart. I know, I know there's some very real things here amongst the people that are sitting here. I know that. And I'm not making light of any of it. I know, I know how painful life can be. But I'm telling you, the circumstances we are in on earth don't even compare to the glory that's waiting for us in that next life. This too shall pass. My dad was laying in the hospital in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, he, he, he contracted COVID. Yeah, he got pneumonia in one lung. Uh, a, a hospital in Sterling had sent him home then, and uh, and within 18 hours he had double pneumonia. So then he went back to the hospital and they sent him to Rockford. And in Rockford they said, "Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll beat this." And within three days they said, uh, oh, "We're not going to beat this." And so they began to talk to the family and that that you know it's uh, it's it's probably past the point uh, of him coming out of this. And so uh, we talked to my dad, who had always said, I don't want any extra measures. When it's my time, it's my time. So we talked to my dad, said, Dad, here's what the doctors are saying. What do you want to do? And he goes, whatever it takes to save my life, which was very uncharacteristic of him. He had never said that before. And we went, oh, okay, change plan here, guys. <laughs> and uh, so for the next couple of days, we were coming and visiting him, and we were talking to him, and pretty soon, uh, this was a Thursday, and uh, my brother and I rode up together, and uh, we were walking into the hospital, actually down his corridor, and uh, we recognized his doctor had just come out of his room, and the doctor came up to us and said, your dad just looked up to me and went. Now, my brother and I are smart enough to trust but verify. So we went into my dad's room. He said, okay, 
Pops, here's what the doctor said. What does this mean? And he said, does that mean you're ready just to stop all this? He said, yes. He couldn't talk. He couldn't hardly hear. But he said, yes. Yeah. I'm ready to, just, I'm ready to go home. And of course, he's been a believer since 1965. Uh, a lot of fruit in his life. We knew where he was going. So I'll tell you what. You know what? It became job number one for me. Get him to the other side. Now, my brother, 10 years younger than me, he was a little more dependent upon my mom and my dad, um, and, and, and he struggled with that decision. He was like, well, maybe if we just did this. I'm like, Steve, what are we here to do? Well, we're here to do what's best for dad. I said, exactly. But the doctors are telling us is the best thing for dad is just to go home. And he's like, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and so we did. We, we, we just made him comfortable. And I think it was about 24 hours after that decision, he was home in glory. And I can't even, I can't even in my own mind imagine what that, that next moment after he took his last breath was like when he met the Savior. And when he experienced everything, because because the Bible says <clears throat> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I just I don't believe in this sleep thing for until Jesus comes back and all that. I believe if Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, I believe we're immediately I don't know how it all works. I don't have to. I just trust that the Bible is true. And so I know my dad was in glory a second after he took his last breath. And you know what the beauty of that is? Is my dad lived his life in glory. So the afterlife for him, glory. That's our motivation in this life. That's our purpose in this life. We hope for the glory of heaven. So we live the glory of heaven here on earth. Does that make sense? I, I, I just, I can't imagine living my life complaining about everything. Oh, my toe hurts. Oh, my knee hurts. i got to tell you, every day at 63, every day something different hurts in my body. And I don't even have to do anything for it to hurt. I'm ready for glory. Physically here, I'm also ready to go to glory. I'm going to hang on a little while just to, keep, just to watch you and make sure you stay in line. But we were designed to reflect the glory of God. I, I'm going to challenge you this week. <clears throat> this is a challenge. I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to open up for testimonies next week, and my challenge is come with a testimony of how you saw a marked difference in your life because you've accepted the fact that no matter what's going on in my physical body or my mental state, that I've decided to shine for the glory of God. And I want to hear your testimony about it. Next week, week after that, however long it takes. Because I'm just going to tell you something. If this world's all we got, we might as well drink Kool-Aid. <laughs> you know, we might as well just jump off a cliff. If this life's all we got, but we are promised a glory, an eternal glory in heaven, which will be far more magnificent than the glory that shines through us here on earth. Because there'll be no division, there'll be no veil, there'll be nothing separating us from the actual physical presence of God. That is worth whatever life throws at us. Going through it, shining for Him, during it, and hoping for that eternal glory that's going to come someday. Does this encourage you at all? Let me, let me, let me just say one more thing. If this sounds like work to you, and it scares you, 
just got to put on the mind of Christ. Because that's a human mindset, human thinking. How am I going to do this? How am I going to shine for the Lord at the grocery store when they're out of Captain Crunch? Now, in my family, that's a big deal. Captain, they don't have any Captain Crunch on us. Because i got to tell you, when Cheryl cooks me a bowl of Captain Crunch, I'm telling you, she knows how to fix a good bowl of cereal. And so... I mean, I know that's silly, but I'm telling you, some of the stuff that we are worried about is so silly because we're looking at the physical side and we're forgetting that the spiritual side fixes all the stuff in the physical side. I know a guy who... uh, I, I, I just... I know of a situation where someone had a miracle... And you know what the enemy is trying to do? The enemy is trying to put all these thoughts of physical life in his head. And it's beginning to mess with them a little bit. And what happens is when, when we have this miraculous interaction with the Lord, and then all of a sudden we let the physical things begin to like um, occupy our minds, is we begin to forget how miraculous that thing was that was supposed to give us uh, joy and peace and, 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 and that, that, that overwhelming presence of God. But if we let the cares of this world in, it will rob you of that glory. And you were designed for glory. I hope this encourages you. It's not, it's not terrifically hard work, except that you have to physically stop thinking with your human mind and reasoning and intellect, and you have to start letting the Word dwell in you richly. You have to begin to think like Christ. I don't know what Christ is thinking. Just open this and He'll tell you, because it's in here. This is what Christ is thinking. Amen. I just want to pray for each of us. I think we can do this group thing because there's not one of us that hasn't faced something in the last few months that can knock us off of our of our glory trail. So I just want to pray for each of you. Do you have uh, something to flow with after that? I'm sorry. I'm still going to pray for you too. I don't want to bring you out of your place, but uh, I just want to pray for us, and I want to I want to give you hope, and I want to pray that uh, that you will let God do what He designed you to do, so that you begin to shine the glory of God in your life. So, Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are glory. You are magnificent. You are worthy of our worship. Not because of what you do for us. It's easy to worship you for what you do for us. You're worthy of our worship because you alone are worthy. And your glory was designed to shine on us and through us. It was designed to make us look like you, your representative on earth. And so, Father... I pray for each person that's here today, from the youngest to the oldest, from the sickest to the healthiest, from the one struggling with faith to the one who lives by faith daily. I think that covers everybody here. I pray, Father, that we would get a glimpse of your glory and it would change our heart. It would change our mind. And it would change us. It would transform us. It would transfigure us so that we would shine with the glory of God that every word from our mouth would testify of your goodness. God, you're so good. I 
pray that even in the midst of our darkest night, even in the midst of the, 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 the pain, even in the midst of the despair, that, Father, we'd take our eyes off of the thing that's trying to hinder your glory, and we would put our eyes upon your glory, and then let that glory shine upon us. Finally, I pray that this would not be a temporary thing, but this would become a lifestyle for each of us. If there's not one person here who's got it all figured out and does everything right every single time because we're human. But you see us as glory carriers. You see us as holy and blameless in your sight. You see us as children, sons and daughters of the Most High God. You see us as we will be. And that gives us the motivation to carry your glory for the rest of our days here on earth, knowing that it doesn't end there. It's just the beginning. Do that work in our heart, God, right? Do that work in our mind, Lord, right now. Do that work in our body, right now. The physical, the physical dysfunction and disease cannot be healed until the mind changes. Until we believe by faith that you've promised us the benefits of salvation. And so, Father, we trust you. We give everything to you. We surrender it all to you, which means it's up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.